So a little, uh, just to, to emphasize again, so as, as mentioned by Corey, this is the second webinar in the series. This is the CA cost report opportunity. And what we're going to focus on today is, is, as we've done a number of analysis over the years, what we've done is we, we often say that we're going to marry the art and science of cost report preparation. Now, most times what ends up happening is, is when we look at the cost report, most accounting firms, most other entities are really good at the science side of cost report preparation. So they know where to put the numbers, they know how it flows through, and they use that as a basis to really drive the information in the report. What we tend to do is when we look at the cost report, we merge it from an art perspective with that science. So what we do is we take what we realize from operations and operating different hospitals and say, if we were to present this information in a different way, or if we were to evaluate things perspective, how could that improve the financial position of the organization, or how could we improve the accuracy of that information? As I showed everybody yesterday, uh, this is the population health transition framework. And today we're really gonna focus on the payment system. And that's that section down here on the bottom of the transition framework. And what our hope is, is that by looking at these different opportunities will allow us to improve again, that financial position of our organization. I don't think there's anybody on this call that would like to say that they don't want to improve their reimbursements or improve their financial position. So again, this is the look at different strategies that we can implement through improving the accuracy that will ultimately improve our financial position. As we walk through these recommendations today, uh, again, same thing as yesterday, if you have something that pops up and you'd like to ask a question or for me to go in further detail, um, please let me know. Um, if not, I will continue to work through the presentation. Um, today's presentation will probably not take the full hour uh, unless there are questions that arise from the, the different areas that we're discussing. As we work through, again, some of the different areas will have uh, financial metrics or financial outcomes tied to the recommendations, and some of the others are just recommendations that could lead to further discussion or areas from that regard. So uh, without much ado, I'll jump right into the different recommendations. So when we look at the cost report, one of the ones that we often see is with critical access hospitals in establishing an actual bad debt policy. Um, back in the day when Medicare used to reimburse critical access hospitals 100% of the allowable bad debt, this had a much bigger impact on, on actually getting those claims onto the cost report. Now, even though they've reduced the percentage to the 65% of allowable Medicare bad debt, it still provides an incentive to the critical access hospitals to actually establish a bad debt policy. So what many organizations will do is, is that they will deem a claim as bad debt internally and they will send it off to a collection company. However, what ends up happening is, is that they won't actually reach back out or implement a policy to pull that claim back from the collection company. So that claim will sit out there in perpetuity. Until you actually pull back that claim, you cannot include it on your cost report as allowable bad debt. So what we recommend to organizations is to implement a standard that says after a certain period of time, maybe 180 days or 270 day, 70 days, again, implement something that works for your system. There is no standard across the board that says it has to be X days. You want to implement something that allows you to deem a claim worthless after a period of time and pull it back from that collection company so that you can then include it on your cost report as allowable bad debt. The next is working with your cost report preparer. Now, when we look at investment funds, what happens is, is many critical access hospitals will have funds that are either sitting in a checking account or some other non-designated account. So what we say is we often work with critical access hospitals to establish funds in a board designated funded depreciation account. Now, when we set those, sides, those funds aside in a board designated funded depreciation account, it allows us to not have to subtract the interest earned from the interest expense on the cost report. So the way it works on the cost report is when we have funds that are earned, that are earning interest, the interest earned on those funds has to be subtracted from the interest expense as an allowable offset before we can actually determine the cost-based rate. 
By setting those funds aside in a board designated fund depreciation account, it allows us to avoid that significant offset. Now, in addition to that, to take a step further, what we also need to be cognizant of is if we end up setting those funds aside, we still have to remain aware of those funds and the amount of income that they're earning because Medicare can still take things from unnecessary borrowing. Um, and the way they establish that is if you have a certain amount of funding set aside, what they'll say is that you don't need to borrow money if you have a certain amount of days cash on hand. So again, it's looking at all of those different factors to say, do we have excess funds and should we actually implement a treasury function to invest those funds instead of just leaving them in a checking account? And then again, establishing them as board designated so we don't get that, that offset on the cost report. The next goes more into the step down of overhead costs. So the way the cost report works is, is especially for medical records, is medical record cost is stepped down to all of the different departments that have some type of medical record allocation to it. Meaning that any service that uses medical records or has medical record functions performed for that department will get some corresponding medical record cost allocated to it. So when we look at those different departments, what ends up happening is, is the most common methodology for medical records allocation is based on gross charges. And what ends up happening is, is that when we use gross charges to allocate medical record costs, we tend to over allocate costs to departments that have a lower amount of time to actually provide or perform those medical record services. So to put an example, if we look at a laboratory department versus the inpatient unit, it takes significantly more time to actually code a inpatient claim than it does for lab claims. However, when we use gross charges, because we mark up our laboratory costs or our laboratory charges significantly more than inpatient, we tend to over allocate the medical records costs to departments such as laboratory or diagnostic imaging and away from departments like med surge, our inpatient unit. So what we recommend is working with our cost report preparer and actually implementing a time study so that we appropriately allocate costs based on the departments that actually utilize those services. Now, if we have a couple different coders, um, there's different ways we can actually allocate that cost. If we have a couple different coders and one is dedicated 100% to inpatient and the other coder is 100% to outpatient services, you could directly allocate 50% of that cost for that coder to the inpatient unit, and then the other coder you would actually divide out based on the step down with the time studies over those different departments. So again, the goal of this is to increase accuracy, and by increasing accuracy in this perspective, we can actually pass on a greater amount of cost to the inpatient unit, which has a higher cost-based percentage than many of our outpatient departments. The next area is the worksheet E part B. And as we talk to many CFOs across the country, it's interesting to have a conversation around the amount of cost that's passed on to Medicare beneficiaries through the way the cost report works on the, the step down and then also the application of the coinsurance. So the way it works for the Medicare on the outpatient side is Medicare takes 20% of the charges, so the hospital charges, and passes that on to the beneficiary in the way of coinsurance. So what ends up happening is, is as our hospitals continue to increase charges across the board, it continues to increase the amount or the proportion of cost passed on to the beneficiary. When Greg and I, my colleague Greg Wolf and I looked at this a year ago, in 2019, we found out that there were actually roughly 20 hospitals that passed on 100% of the outpatient cost to the beneficiaries in the way of coinsurance. And that's because their charges were so much higher than the cost that they were passing on that proportion to those patients. So what we tend to flag is when we're looking at this, and you can pull the information right up on the worksheet E part B, we tend to flag anything where greater than 40% of the cost of care is passed on to the beneficiaries in the way of coinsurance. 
Um, I used an example. Iowa is actually a pretty good job uh, of setting their charges. They had only passed on 35% of their costs. I tend to not use the state that we're actually presenting to just for um, uh, keep it a little bit separate. And then a lot of times organizations will like to to discuss how we actually derive the information, but then also why it's so high. And to to put in a different perspective, I was talking to a CFO recently and their organization's policy was actually to be a low cost provider to their beneficiaries. When we actually pulled open their cost report, we found out that they were passing on 90% of the cost of care to their beneficiaries through the way of coinsurance. And when we think about the goal of actually being a low cost provider, if we're passing on 90% of the cost of care to the beneficiary, we are not a low cost provider from that perspective. And again, because of how the cost from a coinsurance perspective is passed on to patients, as we continue to increase our charges, we continue to increase the cost to those beneficiaries, but we also increase the likelihood that those patients will start to seek out alternatives and less uh, expensive services for actually getting their care delivery in the future. If we evaluate our charge master increases each year and compare that to our cost increases, as a general statement, any year where our charges are increasing at a greater percentage than our cost means that we will continue to pass on a greater proportion of cost to the beneficiaries through the way of that coinsurance. Now, again, this is not saying to automatically cut our cost or cut our charges. What it's saying is just to remain the cognizant of the two, because if we have a commercial payer that's paying us a percent of charge, we don't want to lose out on that opportunity to increase our charges that would then increase our reimbursements for future years. So again, we want to make sure that we balance the two and establish that effective pricing strategy as we continue to move forward. The next area we're going to talk about is the allocation of square footage. So the way it works on the cost report is most of the depreciation for the facility and all of the things affixed to that are set down on the cost report based on the square footage allocated to each department. Now we carve out certain equipment and that's set down either based on direct depreciation or the actual department used. However, the cost of the facility itself is stepped down based on the depreciation and the square footage allocated. So what ends up happening is is that we tend to flag any hospital where there is not at least 300 square feet allocated for each inpatient bed. The reason why we use 300 square feet is when we assume not just that the room itself goes into the factor, however, all of the hallways, the nurses stations, any rooms that are dedicated solely to the inpatient unit, all of those different areas should go into the med surge department calculation. Generally, the only time we will see the square footage lower than 300 square feet per is if you're running dual uh, beds per room. Um, However, as those continue to decline, especially in the environment of COVID, uh, we generally like to see at least 300 square feet per bed allocated to the med surge department. And again, the reason why we're looking at this is one is to make it more accurate. But again, because our med surge departments are often 70, 80 percent cost based by appropriately allocating the information between the different departments allows us to get a higher level of reimbursement from Medicare based on that accuracy. So, again, we're not saying to overstate the information. What we're saying is, is to ensure that information is accurate and through that accuracy will improve the financial performance of the organization. The next area we're gonna talk about is the ED time studies. Um, Every organization that runs an emergency department needs to track the amount of time that's allocated between the professional component and the standby component. The reason why we need to do this is because under a critical access hospital, we are allowed to include the cost associated with standby time for providers as an allowable expense on the cost report. However, we need to carve out all of the time that's allocated for the professional component. What ends up happening though is most critical access hospitals will either use the EHR to directly track or they will have 
some type of person that tracks when the physician comes into the emergency room and leaves the emergency room. What we like to see is most organizations to actually leverage some type of technology as a means to track that or actually conduct time studies as required by Medicare to actually determine what the true professional time should be. Now, when we talk about the tracking of professional time, it's the discussing, documenting, or delivering care. Any other care or any other time should actually be tracked as standby time. Now, the example up on here actually shows an organization where we pulled their cost report cost, we pulled the charges. So this organization had about $3.05 million in direct cost, fully allocated cost to that department. And there was about $17 million in charges. So the ratio of cost to charge for this organization was about 17.17, uh, so about 17%. When we end up multiplying that by the Medicare charges, which was just over $6 million, they ended up receiving about a million dollars in reimbursement from Medicare for that service. However, their professional time was 38 minutes per visit. This is significantly higher than what we see for most critical access hospitals. As an organization, we will flag anything that has greater than 20 minutes of professional time for uh, professional time for that provider in the emergency room. So what we did is we ended up recalculating their ratio of cost to charge to assume that they could get to that 20 minutes of professional time instead of the 38 minutes. So by reducing that down to that 20 minutes, we were able to add roughly $450,000 back onto the cost report. Now, the total charges remained exactly the same, so that remained at that $17.2 million. But if we look, the ratio of cost to charge actually increased from the 17.6% up to 20.2%. And what that means is that we're gonna actually get a greater percentage of the Medicare charges in the way of reimbursement. So by them getting to that 20 minute threshold would have increased their reimbursements just from Medicare by $156,000. I'm sure everybody on the phone right now could use an additional $156,000. When we end up looking at that further, the, the companies or the hospitals that are actually leveraging technology to track this are actually at a best practice 15 minutes per visit as an average of professional time. So what this would have allowed us to do is if we could have actually got down to 15 minutes would have allowed us to add on roughly another $110,000 in cost, which would have been then flown through the cost report and increased our reimbursements by another $35,000, $40,000. So again, this is one where it's directly relevant in the accuracy of information plays a, a direct role in the level of reimbursement that we get. So time studies is very important for our critical access hospitals, especially within our emergency department. Now, when we end up looking at this, the, the scenario up here is for if we end up employing the providers, there's also different opportunities if we end up creating professional service agreements with physician groups, where we can actually include a greater portion of the cost as an allowable expense, so long as we're doing reconciliation at the end of the year to ensure that there's a reasonableness for the cost that's actually included on the cost report. So again, it's looking at all of those different opportunities to ensure that we're optimizing our reimbursement. The next one is around the track part A time for physicians. Now, when we look at this, this is a partial carryover from the prior one. However, what we wanna look at is any of our, provision, profession, uh, our physicians that are providing professional services, we need to carve out their corresponding cost from the cost report before they actually step down and determine those cost-based rates. However, when we have physicians or other providers that are performing medical directorships or chief of staff functions or other administrative type work, that cost can actually remain on the cost report as an allowable expense. So again, it's tracking our providers and ensuring that we're only removing the cost that must be removed and allowing us to keep on the cost that allows us to continue to get that cost-based reimbursement. 
The next area is around our, our ratio of cost to charges. So what we tend to look at is with our ratio of cost to charges is again, tying back to that 40% threshold with the worksheet E part B on the passing on of costs, we always look at the ratio of cost to charges. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that the charge structure for each individual department at least is high enough to cover the cost of the department, but then also not so high that we're ending up only getting 10 cents on the dollar for the services that we're providing. So again, it's making sure that as we establish that defensible pricing strategy, that the pricing methodology allows us to receive an adequate level of reimbursement, but does not mark up those charges too high or are not too low to actually offset from that perspective. So again, it's, it's, it's a fine line to stay between, but again, what we want to do is we want to make sure that as we're establishing that pricing structure, that we take into account the overall RCCs of each of the departments and the actual services that we're providing. Any questions thus far for the first two pages before we keep going? I know sometimes people tend to uh, fall asleep during cost report presentations, but I figured I'd afford the opportunity. All right, I will keep going. The next area is really looking at the nursing administration department. So when we end up looking at nursing administration, we want to ensure that only the nursing administrator, either the CNO or the DON, and any direct administrative support staff are included on the, the nursing administration line on the cost report. And the reason for that is because the nursing administration line on the cost report steps down to the departments that require direct nursing supervision. So what ends up happening is, is that a lot of critical access hospitals will include floor supervisors or charge nurses or other individuals into that chief nursing officer position or that department, whether it's infection control or performance improvement. So those departments will end up stepping down to only the departments that require direct nursing supervision. Anytime you have a charge nurse or a floor supervisor, we like to see those directly allocated to the departments they're supervising or working on because that's a more accurate methodology to step down costs. When we think about the allocation of costs, Medicare really looks at it from three different perspectives. You have direct allocation, functional allocation, and the pooled methodology. The direct allocation is the first way and preferred way. Anytime we can directly allocate costs to a department or to a, a service line, we want to do that because that's the most accurate way to actually assign costs to that department. The next area is the functional. And if we cannot allocate costs through a direct, we want to use the functional methodology. Through the functional methodology, we'll actually step down costs based on the utilization by that department. So say laundry, based on the laundry actually used within a hospital, we can use the functional methodology to actually step down that cost to each of the individual departments for that department. Now, when we look at nursing administration, that uses that functional methodology to step down costs. Because it aligns based on direct nursing supervision, we can align that cost based on a functional alignment to those different departments. The last area is really a pooled methodology. And this is the one that we use when one of the other two methodologies cannot be determined or used to step down costs. Under the pooled methodology, we will consolidate that remaining cost and then we will step down that to the different departments, whether it's based on gross expenses or some other methodology based on the pooling of that cost. But again, it's, it's the, the least preferred methodology by Medicare. However, in some circumstances, we cannot align that cost in any other way except for a pooled methodology. So again, when we look at that nursing administration, because we can use the functional methodology to apply that cost, we want to ensure that only the nursing administrator and any direct support staff are including in that position. Any of those other positions we would want to include in either administrative in general, like if it's infection control, or if it's a charge nurse, we'd want to include that on 
med surge or wherever else they could be allocated to. The next area we're gonna talk about is interim cost reports. When we look at interim cost reports, they provide an organization with an opportunity first to either accrue a due from or a due to Medicare based on the changes and expenses and revenue and volume throughout that year. So because we're a critical access hospital, when we end up filing our cost report at the end of the fiscal year, there's always a reconciliation process. So what ends up happening is, is that once we process that cost report, Medicare will look at that cost report at the end of the year and say, based on the expenses and the volumes that you had that drove the charges, you should have received X dollars. And throughout the year, they were paying you on that prior year's cost report. So in those situations, if they ended up overpaying you, Medicare is going to try and recoup that money. And if they underpaid you, Medicare is going to provide you that money as a reconciliation payment. So when we end up looking at that, we want to establish an actual internal threshold so that if we end up showing a due from Medicare, and I just said $500,000, however, this is something we want to establish internally. If we have a significant due from Medicare, we want to establish a process where we actually file that interim cost report with Medicare so that we can update our rate. <laughs> and the reason for it has that reconciliation process. However, as Medicare Advantage plans continue to grow, there is no reconciliation process for the Medicare Advantage plan. So if we're owed $500,000 from Medicare, and Medicare Advantage is 50% of the business of Medicare, we would have lost out on potentially a quarter million dollars by not filing that interim cost report. So what I always like to say is if you're showing a due from, it's always good to file. However, on the reverse side, if you ever have a due back to Medicare, set that money aside. Again, because there is no reconciliation process with Medicare Advantage, we do not want to give back money that we otherwise would not have to give back because there is not that reconciliation process. But again, we want to establish an internal policy so that first we are at least generating interim cost reports. And then if it passes that predetermined threshold that we actually file a cost report to update our rates. The next area is really on the LDRPs and med surge. Um, not many critical access hospitals are still providing delivery services. However, those that are, we want to ensure that we're accurately tracking the time between delivery and med surge. So what ends up happening is, is a lot of times organizations will carve out all of the square footage associated with the LDRP. And what ends up happening is, is that leads to an over allocation of cost to the delivery and not enough cost allocated to the med surge room. So the way Medicare, Medicare has defined it is only the time when a patient is actively in delivery is that considered the LDRP. Once the baby is born, that time actually becomes med surge or the room allocation. And the cost associated with that room should then again be allocated to med surge. So again, this is another one where the importance of a time study to keep track of the time for allocation between delivery and med surge can impact the reimbursements received as an organization. The next is really looking at departments with low charges. So again, as we talk about the, the RCCs for each individual department, we also want to evaluate each department from an ROI perspective. So realizing that for Medicare, the best we're ever going to do is cost-based reimbursement. The only chance that we have to make margin as a critical access hospital is from non-cost-based payers. So as we establish these different departments and look at creating them, we want to ensure that we're generating enough business from non-cost-based payers to actually turn a positive margin for that department. And what we've often seen is that, say for a department, maybe radiology, 
Um, maybe the cost-based rate is $1,000 a visit for a CT scan. However, our commercial payers are only paying us $200. That means we're losing $800 relative to cost for that service. Now, I'm not saying that we should get rid of radiology by any means, but what I'm saying is to use it as a basis to start to engage in those conversations but then also using it to dictate how we are actually going to drive volumes and marketing efforts across the hospital, realizing that our goal as a critical access hospital should be from a cost-based perspective is to continue to push volumes to a point where we're actually getting greater reimbursements from non-cost-based payers than from cost-based payers. And that's how we can continue to improve our bottom line as an organization. The next area we're going to talk about is the allocation of actual cost and looking at where the patients are assigned on the cost report. So when we end up operating a swing bed program, there's two lines on the cost report on worksheet F3-1 that we assign patients. Line five is where we include all of our Medicare and Medicare Advantage days and any Medicaid, non-Medicare, non-Medicare advantage, so any of our commercial workers comp, any other patient day should go on line six on the cost report on that S31. Now, the reason why this is important is if we report non-Medicare, non-Medicare advantage days that are swing bed days on line five, those days go into actually determining our cost-based rate. Medicare. So what Medicare says is that if you take any swing bed patient that is not Medicare or non-Medicare Advantage, we are only going to carve out what's your nursing facility rate and use that to subtract costs off the cost report. But then we're also going to remove those days from the cost report before determining your routine rate. So when we end up including those days onto your cost report, it ends up over allocating the number of days and then ends up diluting down your routine rate. So when we look at this up on the screen, if we look at this hospital, they had about $4.8 million in routine costs. And they had about $90,000 in a NF carve out. Again, those are all those swing bed NF days. So the total cost is about $4.6 million. And they had 4,700 days. So their routine rate was $990 per patient day. And you multiply that by the 3,777 days and they received $3.7 million in reimbursement. And now if this organization had put the days on the appropriate line, those days on the line six instead of five, we can see that under the proposed, the inpatient routine costs remained exactly the same. However, the NF carve-out rate went up by almost $14,000. And again, the reason why it went up is we multiplied those 107 days that were stated on the wrong line by that NF carve-out rate, which then increased the NF carve-out. So their total cost dropped to $4.6 million. So it only came down that $13,000, $14,000. However, we pulled out the 107 days. So when we look at their routine rate, the routine rate went from that $990 up to $1,010. So they had a $20 increase in the routine rate. Now the Medicare Advantage days and the Medicare days remained exactly the same. But again, you're getting that 3,700 days times the $20 per visit. And that's how the routine rate ended up driving the increase in reimbursements by roughly the $75,000. So again, this is looking at those as an opportunity to improve the financial position of the organization by ensuring that the information is accurate. So a lot of times what ends up happening is, is a cost report preparer will get a file from the hospital that will include a consolidation of patient days. We want to ensure that we track that information appropriately so that when we give them that information, we're not wrongly reporting information on a line that ends up either reducing or overstating the reimbursement that we should receive as an organization. The next area that we're gonna talk about is really on the consolidation of cost reports for rural health clinics. 
Now, I know there's a number of hospitals in Oklahoma that are actually increasing the number of rural health clinics that they have. When we operate multiple rural health clinics, we have the opportunity to consolidate those cost reports for cost report purposes. Now, I want to emphasize that each clinic, you still have to meet all of the RHC requirements. Um, so from a surveying perspective and a management perspective, you have to operate them all as distinct RHCs and meet those requirements. However, from a cost report perspective, we're able to file a single set of M schedules for the combined clinics instead of filing a separate set of M schedules for each of the clinics. So when we look at the example up there, this hospital system had seven rural health clinics. However, they chose to file each of those RHCs on a separate cost report. If they had sought and received approval from the FI to actually consolidate those cost reports, it would have increased their reimbursement by about $260,000. So in this situation, they would have actually gotten $260,000 more to do less paperwork. So not bad from that perspective. And the reason why the consolidation of cost reports can end up benefiting hospitals and systems that operate multiple RHCs is when we file a single cost report for the consolidated RHCs, we end up merging the fully allocated costs, the visits, and the Medicare visits. So what we do is we remove the pricing and the cost variability between the different clinics and create a consolidated rate. Another benefit of consolidating the clinics is that if we have certain practices or clinics that are not meeting the minimum productivity threshold, <clears throat> productivity threshold, by consolidating those clinics, Medicare will only look at the combined FTEs for determining that minimum productivity threshold. So the excess visits at some practices can actually cover the shortage of visits at the other practices. And if we look at the example up here, we can see that actually this clinic had that as a situation there where 487 visits, they were short in one of the practices. And by consolidating those practices actually led to them to reduce the minimum productivity threshold, which then again, increased their reimbursement. The last one we're gonna focus on today is the consolidation of ICUs into med surge. So there's many critical access hospitals that are still operating distinct ICUs in addition to their med surge department. And what ends up happening is, is this creates two different rates, one for the ICU and one for the med surge department. And then also a difference in the cost-based reimbursements based on the payer mix for those different service lines or those different inpatient units. So when we look at what's provided, this organization was running a distinct med surge and a distinct ICU. Now, the routine rate for the med surge was about $3,000, and the routine rate for the med surge or the ICU was about $5,500. And they received $6 million roughly from the med surge and $1.3 million from the ICU, so a total reimbursement of about $7.2 million. If they were to actually combine those two, units into a single med surge unit with a progressive unit that could have actually handled the patient. They would have combined the cost for those two different areas. They would have also combined the visit. So what we see is by increasing those units and actually combining them together, you end up merging the cost of that ICU under the med surge department and create a single combined cost. And you divide the visits and then multiply across the Medicare. So by doing that, what ended up happening is, is if this organization actually merged them, their reimbursements would have gone up by about $37,000. Again, by merging them. And the difference between this organization was because the two units had a different payer mix. So by merging the two together allowed them to actually increase the reimbursement by blending that payer mix together. Now, I, I don't want to say that this works 100% of the time. Um, there are situations or circumstances where it is better to maintain a separate unit if you can maintain the volume or you have patients that are actually requiring that higher level of care. 
So again, uh, uh, for those finance individuals on here, it's not to say just to automatically merge those two. This is one where you'd want to have a conversation with your nursing staff to ensure that merging them actually allows you to meet an effective level of care, but then provide care to the patient at the level they need from that perspective. So what I want to do now is uh, open it up if there's any questions. I know we've covered a bunch of different areas. Um, this is also, again, being recorded uh, so people can listen uh, again after the fact. And if questions arise at a later date, please feel free to, to reach out and we can definitely answer any of those questions that you have. But I'll open it up for a moment. Okay, um, again, if you have questions that pop up, um, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm gonna turn it back over to Corey for a minute. Um, what we'll end up doing is send out a request to individuals and, and try to garner some topics maybe that, that you would like to have as a part of the webinar series. But again, what we wanna do is we want to ensure that these topics are informative, but then also allow you as operators to, to get information that's more relevant and, and pertinent to what you're experiencing either in today's times with COVID or just general operating positions uh, as a going forward basis. Corey, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. So everybody, please be thinking about things that you would like to, the other topics that you would like to hear from or hear Jonathan, hear from Jonathan. Um, we want to make these meaningful to you, and so um, any any suggestions that you have, we'd love to hear your feedback. Like Jonathan said, we're going to have the links and the slides available to you after each webinar, so we'll be sending that information out soon. Um, but again, in the meantime, please feel please think about things that you'd like to hear, and feel free to reach out to myself or Laura or Pete here in the office for help or Jonathan as well for any questions or feedback that you may have. So thanks again to everybody for joining us today.